All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the live session with Eric Askew. Uh, we're pleased to have you join us tonight with uh, XMD Academy. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Eric Askew. He'll be discussing 3D printing tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to ask anything in the chat. Uh, it's going to be a fun-filled night, and uh, we're going to have a Q&A uh, towards the end of the meeting. Um, so, Eric, uh, if you could just uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I'm the lead artist over at Collapse Industries, and I have my own uh, brand, um, and I make models for 3D printing, but it's not all I do. I also engineer the models um, as, with the new version of ZBrush that's come out. Uh, engineering the models in ZBrush has become faster and easier. And um, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about um, tonight is things that you can do um, more or less on your own. Uh, but in the past, we would have, we would actually hire an engineer to, uh, to make our models print ready and they would use a different software. Now it's, now it's getting to be uh, much, it, now it's all up. I, I can do it all myself. Um, so it makes it that much easier. Um, but the funny thing is, is that um, all the work that I've done over the years, uh, both in the physical realm, uh, you know, not the 3D printing, but actually physically making them, uh, all that stuff is transferable. And the weird things that come up uh, in 3D printing would never come up in the physical uh, medium. Um, so a lot of the stuff started coming to, to the forefront of uh, what we wanted to talk about with the course. Um, after, uh, after Mike invited me to teach this course, um, it, it was, it's surprising, um, what people don't know, uh, about, um, preparing models for 3d printing and, and how to make them, um, higher quality, uh, without having to, you know, go through a lot of, you know, um, heavy technical, uh, workflows. Um, most of it's actually very straightforward, um, but it's things you wouldn't know unless you were working with somebody who's like a, like a master mold maker or a 3D guy that's a 3D print, uh, 3D print guru. Um, you really wouldn't know these things. So we're coming at this from the art side. And that's, that's really a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the course, um, how to get standardization, how to, how to uh, eliminate uh, problems, how to uh, pitch a piece so that you get the best um, print quality out of it um, in, in one one format and also in the other format how to improve the speed of a part through cut up because um, uh, that's also important so yeah that's really what the course is going over mostly now you uh, you wanted to show us something pretty cool about a uh, standard keys um, do you want to go ahead and share your screen Sure thing, just a second. Now, if anybody has any questions or anything, you can just uh, throw them into the chat. All right, so real quick, um, I'm just gonna show you guys a basic standard key. Uh, give me a second here. My hot key wasn't working. Ah, my balloon's on too. There we go. And turn on double. There we go. So real quick, um, making a model, uh, the sphere is gonna be the object that we're gonna cut, and this is just a quick example. Uh, but making a model uh, have a standard key is kind of necessary. A lot of people are un under the misconsumption that a uh, key should be structural. Um, and that's really not the case. You really don't want the key to be structural. Also understanding things like, say for instance, um, draft angles are really important as well. In fact, if we come in here, and look at how these guys come together. The male is beveled and the female is hard edge. And that has a lot to do with both the capillary action, but also how the key's gonna work. Um, and when I, I explained this to another gentleman just recently, and he was kind of blown away by this, but um, the, the top of my key, 
never ever touches the uh, keyhole, only the side panels do. And that has a lot to do with how we're casting and molding these um, uh, in our shop in-house. Because um, we do take all the parts and pieces and uh, cast them. But this is how we're gonna set this up. So real quick, um, over here, I've got, uh, <clears throat> I've got my sphere, I've got my keys, and I've got my plane. Now my plane needs some thickness. You always wanna take a little bit of material out. Um, and uh, we're just gonna add some thickness so you guys can see this. Usually I use a lot less. And then if we go ahead and Boolean the folder, we will get a part that looks like this. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, hide these pieces. And of course, all right, so my key didn't take for some reason, it might've been turned off, but the female works just fine. We should have had, we'll take this down here. Should have had a male that looked a lot like that. And that's, that's what we wanna see. And this is, uh, this is a standard key. A lot of us, we, we talk about standard keys mostly because <clears throat> a lot of people make some really weird choices in keying. I've seen other professionals make some really bizarre choices in keying. Um, and in a production sense, they really don't work. Um, so this is, this is one of the things we wanted to bring up in the course, but yeah. All right, so um, we had a discussion earlier about, uh, you know, the art of uh, 3D printing is just as much as an art form as it is a uh, science. So could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of the times um, when we're talking about, um, sorry, I just went to try and cancel the share screen for a second. Um, a lot of the time when we're talking about um, making a part 3D printable, a lot of it has to do with um, trying to optimize certain situations, which is a lot like art. Um, you know, it's basically like balancing a composition. Uh, balancing a 3D print, hold on just a second. Sorry, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, we were talking about the art form. Yes, balancing 3D print. Yeah, um, you're really trying to optimize a certain situation. Uh, in the case of, uh, say for instance, an SLA style print, um, you really want to try and make it so that the, the Z lines, the, the grow lines are uh, minimized or optimized for a specific shape or form. A um, specific example of this is anything that's domed um, is going to show those lines no matter what you do. Um, and if you're not, if you don't have a full sphere, if you have like a, a portion of a sphere, like an eyelid or something, you're going to want to angle that so that, and um, so that it has less, uh, less Z lines passing through the apex of the dome, um, kind of like this roll of tape here. You wouldn't want your Z lines passing this way through the dome because that is, um, that's gonna show them much more clearly than if we take this exact same shape and print it this way, where they're almost gonna be invisible. Um, <clears throat> the, some of that comes down to post-processing as well. Um, but yeah, you're trying to optimize the situation. Um, optimizing the cuts, optimizing the, uh, the outcome. Um, also, you wouldn't want to take a piece like, say, for instance, uh, your stylus and print it facing straight up. That's a lot of Z lines. That's a lot of, um, that's a lot of time in the printer. And you can get a much faster result by setting it up and printing it sideways, which is kind of what we did with, you know, this part here. Uh, we split it down the side and laid it on its side like this. And we can print it without supports, and um, uh, we print it in two halves. So you basically split down the middle and laid it out like you'd lay out UVs and put it on the bed. And it prints much, much faster, and it's much more optimized for the situation. A lot of the times, that's the kind of thing that um, that people overlook because if you're if you're just a computer person or if you're just a physical person. Um, 
and that's how you're going to make your assets. You may not realize that the 3D printer is going to have a different set of parameters that you need to meet. So yeah, that's why it's just as much, at least for the asset creating side of things and, and kind of cutting up or the engineering of the side of things, it can be a lot, a lot more like an art form than just a standard, um, you know, throw it in the 3D printer and hope for the best, which is what I find a lot of people do. A lot of people are just kind of, they just kind of chuck things at the wall and hope something's going to stick. Um, and that's not always the best case. Um, so, yeah. Well, what would you, um, we talked about this before, what would you say uh, was your most challenging piece to print? I really don't have anything too challenging. Um, thankfully, I, had, I have a really good background in both physical medium and then I also have many years experience working in um, digital. Um, the funny thing about uh, 3D printing is, is that it really, it really feels a lot like um, do, making the cuts that you would make for UVs. Um, if you understand that um, an object, you know, cutting the uh, UVs for an object is basically like filleting the fish, uh, cutting, cutting models is very much the same way, except you're trying to find, uh, in some instances, you're trying to find the longest bias, and in other instances, you're trying to find the shortest bias. Um, most of the time, um, that kind of thing is, is, is kind of provocative, honestly, because it's, it's how my mind works. It's how you think about things. And speaking of the most, in, the most intense thing I've had to do recently was we started 3D printing our mold jackets. Um, which for those of you that don't know, a mold jacket is the thing that encases the mold itself uh, so that you can pour a given part in resin. Um, and those, those were a real task to figure out, but now that we've got that figured out, it's really just very basic, uh, basic, basic modeling and engineering inside of the computer. And when I say engineering, just I'm not trying to scare anybody. That's really just the term that we use to discuss, okay, we need to have vents here. We need to have drains here. We need to put the cut in this place so that it hides uh, a particular look or makes the part work better. It's not engineering in the sense of building bridges. So. Well, the, uh, and you, you have a free preview of uh, mold jackets uh, in your course right now. Yeah, uh, the mold jacket it, we, we show is the one for a Cthulhu piece. And we show the inside and the outside uh, and the back of the model. And then there's a bunch of touch pins, which is something that we devised for it. And um, that allows us to put the model in the mold. And these little touch pins are like fingertips and they hold the, the part in just the right place so we can put the clay in there. Because your, your mold is going to be a two-part mold with a gasket. <clears throat> so one part is, is poured and then, we, and then you remove the clay and you pour the second part and that way they, they mate together properly. Now do you, uh, do you have any, uh, so what is a piece of knowledge that you would say uh, that not many people would know about 3D printing that you'd like everyone to know? Honestly, it's the thing about scaling. Um, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, one of the first things that ever came across my plate when getting into making models uh, for 3D printing was the scaling part. Um, most of the time we use a standard scale, uh, but what ends up happening is, is that if you go and make a model and then you cut it up and you shrink that model, you're also shrinking the tolerance of how big the key or the cut is. So you actually have to recut it in a lot of cases. You can't just take that model and shrink it. And scaling it up has got the opposite effect. It can be more sloppy, more loose, but a lot of times we can deal with that. Um, However, uh, I've had a couple of people reach out to me and they're like, hey, it worked great at this scale, but I made it, you know, uh, 16th scale and, and now, now nothing works and I have to almost cut off the keys or sand the keys to death to, to, get the, uh, to get the parts to fit. And some of these resins are immensely hard, uh, so that's a lot of work right there. But <clears throat> yeah, it's surprising what gets overlooked. You know, I didn't know about this either. And... Uh, and I was already working in 3D printing and uh, um, the guys I was working with were like, you know, your tolerance has changed when you change scales. And I was like, huh? <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh yeah, I guess it does. 
it really doesn't dawn on you though until you're, you're in it and you're, you're trying to deal with the problems. Yeah, so what, uh, do you, uh, sorry to throw you on the spot here, but do you have any uh, models that um, you have broken up that you could show? Yeah, one of the models that I did for um, uh, a Kickstarter uh, for my brand, um, and I actually should use this model in part of the course. Um, it's uh, one of the demon characters, and it's, uh, it's split up. In fact, um, I can thumb through the parts here. Um, this was cut up in a very, very unusual way, a very unexpected way. Um, let me see here. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, turn polyframe on. And, oh, that's my, that's my marker. Um, the chest, for instance, uh, this was, uh, originally I thought I was going to keep the cloak, the chest armor plate for the cloak attached to the chest. And uh, it really just wasn't going to work, um, not just for the 3D printing, but also for molding and casting. And so I separated it. And we did a um, rather complex contour cut in here um, on the chest. The contour cut is uh, this surface right here, this planar surface here for the key. Um, getting this right is really, it's, it really takes a lot of finesse. Um, and um, it was kind of exciting figuring out this problem. Uh, this part here, this long part here, prints out quite nicely. It's really only about five to six inches. Um, it does have some issues when we go to make it a mold. Um, in fact, we were talking about taking off the tusk here. Um, but most of it really prints up really nicely. Um, you know, some of the things that we'll talk about too, uh, besides draft angles, is line of draft. For instance, uh, this part ended up getting, we ended up having to take the talon off here. But you can see I pushed the, the cloak has been pushed into the leg. Um, so there's a clean line of draft when we go to make a mold for this. Um, and a lot of the times that's stuff that people really don't understand either. The reason the talon came off, for instance, was because if we went to go and pour this in silicone, this would create a, a, a mold lock, meaning that the mold can't be removed from the part. It's just easier to sort of blend them together. You'll also see other small contour cuts like this one here. That's just so the legs and parts go together nicely. Um, but yeah, these models, uh, models like this one, um, you know, they, they take a little bit of time to figure out um, how to piece them together. And it's, it's a lot of uh, sort of puzzle matching, and, you know, trying to find the piece, trying to eliminate uh, certain issues, trying to compromise certain issues. Um, one of the things that you notice is that the torso got removed, but the, the lower leg and uh, cloak, and this is the original base. There's actually two bases, um, but these guys were... Uh, these two parts were separated. We talked about actually making it so that the body, the torso, was attached to the body. Um, and it just didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it was just easier to do a straight cut, which is what this is, a straight cut down here, uh, and just slam them together. <clears throat> and sometimes, sometimes that's just the best way to do things. Um, and again, it's all about optimization. In a lot of cases, um, the way that I might cut this up might be very, very different than somebody else's uh, impression for cutting up uh, the same parts. Also, um, like I said before, uh, the keys, they're, they're not structural. None of my keys are terribly long because the glue is supposed to do all the, all the work. And if we wanted to, we could easily put uh, magnets in this, um, although it's not really something I enjoy doing. It can be done. Um, but um, one of the things I see a lot in people that are trying to get into 3D printing is they make these ridiculously long key keys, which is something I talked about. And if a key shears off, um, you're SOL. Now you've got a nub uh, and your part may never fit together properly again because uh, you've lost the key inside the part. Um, so it's, it's kind of, uh, it's one of the many, many, many things that, uh, that we see we talk about in um, the different communities that I'm a part of and the different people that I work with. So. Uh, Mark Hernandez has a question. Uh, said, are there certain types of keys better at helping parts stay together to hide seams or is it more of a print setting? <clears throat> um, it's an interesting question, Mark, but the truth is, is that I only have two types of keys. Um, we do have some, we do have, we do, I have two types of standard keys, um, and I, and I really don't worry about that. Um, and the reason is, is that, 
uh, if this model is done properly um, and finished properly, um, the seam should just vanish. Um, however, um, it all depends on how you finish a model. Um, when I finish a model, honestly, you know what we do? We take a little bit of epoxy sculpt or even an epoxy putty, we put it in the gap and then we smash the pieces together and wipe it off with a wet finger and they vanish. Um, if it's done right, it's great. If it's not done right, you know, you just gotta, gotta work at it. Um, the key, the keys themselves are, they're, they actually serve two purposes. The reason that this key is here is so that we have a place to pour resin into the mold that we're gonna be making. So you serve more than one purpose. If the key is too long or too obscure or too weird um, or complex, it's gonna be hard to pour resin through that opening. And it's also gonna be hard to put the model together. Um, we do, I do have a triangular version of this key. I hate it, um, but we have had to use it in a couple of small cases. But honestly, this works. So I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel. And it works really well. My boss loves this. He's like, ever since you started making our keys and cutting up the models, everything works great. I have no problems. I'm like, okay, dude. <laughs> So, yeah, if something works, why change it? Um, most of the models that we're making, too, uh, by the way, they're, they're uh, I think, one twelfth scale, and sometimes we make, um, I'm trying to figure out the measurements here, um, one, six, one six scale, one twelfth scale are a lot of the directions that we go with models. Um, we do also do some smaller stuff, but, you know, it's not um, kind of like kind of like to elaborate on this thing. It's a model. It's a statue. It's a toy. Um, you know how much how much grip do you need? <laughs> I mean, are you are you going to be playing outside with this thing and whacking it against the wall? If that's the case, you know, other things are going to break hopefully before the keys do. But you know, there you go. Um, actually, Eric H uh, has a question that how, how much texture shows up in the final after it's printed, such as skin texture and how much, how much resolution do you lose in printing? We usually tell people, we usually tell clients, you're going to lose about 30%. So you want to kind of over embellish things whenever possible. Um, most of the time when we view a model, uh, that's been sculpted by another artist, we use the matte cap white. And we just look at the model and let's see if I can, there we go. This is roughly what the part's gonna look like. Uh, you should retain some of it, you should get some of it back in. Um, but, but you know, generally speaking, this is what you're going for. Um, one of the things to consider and one of the things to know about is simply that um, there are instances in 3D printing that will make your model lose more detail. Uh, the most common one is overbake, which is where someone really doesn't have their lights tuned properly, and the model is actually swelling, almost like if I were to hit this with inflate, and it's overbaking the part. Um, this will eat up detail or make detail less apparent, and it'll also make your keys less likely to fit together properly. Um, it causes all sorts of problems, but I see it constantly with people's work and I don't understand what they're doing wrong um, but their settings are off um, and the best way to check that is to build a cube with an exterior and an interior and measure it with calipers um, that's the physically fastest way to check for overbake um, however if you've got some money you should also own yourself a nice set of uh, um, uh, oh shoot, I forget what the tool is called, but it's called, it's a light calibration tool. Um, we have one in the shop that's actually a couple thousand bucks. Uh, and a light meter. You should have a light meter that helps you to calibrate the bandwidth of light coming out of your 3D printer. Um, I had a quick question. Um, me and you discussed uh, air pockets a while back. Um, and I know you've got a pretty cool technique for finding them. Right. Um, let me see if we can set this up real quick. So we, I use this CAT scan technique, which I came up with shortly after um, the guys over at Pixelogic uh, gave us the, um, 
the uh, live Boolean tools. And what it is is that um, what it is is that we make a cube and we use that cube to look inside the model. And um, I use this in a couple of different ways, but this is the way that I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to put this at a small angle. And we're going to set this to negative. And we're going to turn on live Boolean. And I color this. Um, you want to turn your color off too afterwards. And you draw it, and of course, ZBrush wants to save. Hopefully, it doesn't want to crash. Well, it wants to save when you don't want it to. Right. So don't touch it. <laughs> Right, that's, that's the thing, don't touch it. <laughs> so what we do is we draw the cube into the model and because it's color coded, uh, I can see and I can read the, I can read the, the model and slice uh, through it. Now this is not how the slicer will work when you slice up your model, but it will allow you to say, for instance, let me move this aside, oops. I've been having this weird thing happen with ZBrush lately where it just, jumps. I'm hoping it's not my uh, tablet starting to age. But you can see the key right here shows up as a whole. Um, we can actually pass through the model and look for, for areas that are going to cause us uh, problems. Now I've already checked this model for, th for floaters or for holes or for cavities, but um, there's been a couple of instances where somebody else has cut up a model and I'll have, because they're not using a Boolean technique or they're really not making a very um, they're not making a real good effort to make a clean cut uh, where there will be pockets or holes in and around or, or envelopes, which are just as bad in and around the key um, that can cause vapor lock, which can cause the, the 3d print to pop off of the, um, the tray uh, in FDM printing. Really what that means is, is that now you have an internal cavity that the computer or the, the printer wants to print and is going to take up extra time and cost you more filament because internal walls are always more expensive than, um, than the interior ones. And you can see, although this isn't a cavity or pocket, sometimes they show up like this. And this, this if we were gonna mold and cast this, which we're not gonna do, um, that's gonna get us in trouble and we have to fill that in. Um, but yeah, this is, the, this is the CAT scan technique that I'm gonna teach uh, more about in the course. And it allows you to uh, see the the structure of your parts and make sure that they're gonna they're gonna function properly. All right, uh, Mark Hernandez had one more question. He said, "Do you hollow out each piece you print, and are the keys are the keys places you add holes to reduce suction? Also, when curing your prints, how do you prevent the keys from shrinking and warping? So, hollowing out and shrinking and warping." Mm. Um, hollowing is really only necessary in specific examples um, and certain types of printers. Um, most of the time we hollow our parts in the slicing software. The reason we hollow the parts in the slicing software and not in ZBrush is because ZBrush can, in a lot of cases, produce less than ideal result. Did you let the dogs out? Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently not. Anyway, um, hollowing parts is, is not always necessary, but in a lot of cases, um, you do want to hollow the parts. The main reason for hollowing parts with uh, SLA is to prevent the part from gripping to the membrane uh, where it's being uh, baked. If you're using an, uh, an SLA style printer, like say for instance, the milkshake, um, it doesn't have the same um, issue. Um, because you're not, because that one's uh, a light projection, uh, so it doesn't have a membrane. Uh, neither does the carbon. The carbon, well, the carbon has a membrane, but you don't stick to the carbon. Um, most of the time, that's the real reason that people want to 3D print hollow parts, is to reduce the surface tension of the given part. Um, it is necessary in a lot of cases, but not for everything. In fact, in FDM, which is something that we print a heck of a lot of stuff in, um, there's no reason to hollow stuff because mm, you're printing at, you know, a certain percentage of infill. Most of the time we're printing at 10, 10 to 20% infill at the most. And so the whole thing's hollow to begin with. And it's just the exterior uh, shell, which has um, multiple layers. Um, 
as for the shrinking, I don't, I've never experienced shrinking. Usually we have expansion that's the problem, not shrinking. So I'm kind of kind of confused by that question. Because uh, shrinking, shrinking to me sounds like the part wasn't cured properly in the 3D printer. And it's still gelatinous, I guess. It, it wasn't a full cure. That's, that's a little confusing to me. Um, we do have final cure. We do have a, 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 like a, for lack of a better term, a baking box. You know, the parts come out, they go through their wash, they go through their bath, and then they go in a, a final curing process. Um, it's a, looks like a, a rotisserie with mirrors that uh, shines UV light onto the part for finalization. Um, yeah, I've never had a key shrink. Usually, like I said before, it's usually overbake that's the problem, and it's what I see the most inside of communities, uh, people developing products. Um, Eric H asks, uh, if you have a character with hair, what are your options? Hair should always be volumetric, and I do have a character. I'm not going to open up the file right now, but um, I do show um, several characters with hair. Um, the, the, the hair needs to be a volume. It needs to be a mass. Um, you know, kind of like, kind of like this guy here. Now this is, this is hand sculpted. Am I sharing my screen or am I on the camera? Uh, you're sharing your screen. Right. So, so this character is a little bit older. I'll stop sharing the screen for a second. This character is a little bit over, older, but I can grab this real quick. Um, this guy's hair is a volume. It's a mass. Um, you should always have your hair as a volume or a mass. Um, it should never be fibrous because it won't hold up. It'll, it'll float in the 3D printing bath. Um, it'll make a mess. You'll end up in trouble. Um, and if you look at anybody's toys or characters or figures out there in the world, you know, this guy from Deus Ex, you know, his hair is a volume. Um, so I, I hope that answered that question because it was, you know, I, I didn't have much to go on. Uh, but yeah, it needs to be a volume. It needs to be a volume, always. Um, and I, I make mine with strands, but they're, they're still volume. They're, I never, like, uh, if I were doing, if I were working with Ashley, Ashley uses curve hair or plain or card hair, um, which is what we use in video games in making toys and figures and characters. It needs to be a volume. Otherwise, it's not, it's not going to exist. It's not going to hold up. So... And there is a fantastic XMD brush for that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher your name, but Anna Kit says, do you do any post-processing for paint painting over your meshes? All the 3D prints get post-process. Every last one of them. Um, uh, sometimes it's sanding, sometimes it's chemical, sometimes it's a high particle primer. Um, in fact, this part here, which is for tabletop gaming, this is primed, and I'll turn it upside down so you can see it. This is primed um, with Steinol res, so it's almost like baking the lights in. We use a white Steinol, we paint the whole thing black, and then a white Steinol res gets sprayed from the top down to bake the lights in, and then, so you can see like right there, right there, how it's kind of casting a shadow, um, so that the part represents um, what we want to do. Uh, this is done with an airbrush. Um, and some of the Z-lines do show up, but the truth is is that, um, I'm gonna sneeze. Um, where's my mute button? So sorry, I just cleaned the studio today, so it's very dusty, hey! <laughs> Um, with FDM style prints, you can actually get them to be finer and you can you do a lot of stuff to make them less, um, make the grow lines less apparent. But the truth is, is that for this part here, we use what we call the three foot rule, which is, is that if you hold it at arm's length and you can still see the grow lines, you know, um, which, which is what I'm doing. I'm holding it. I'm holding it like this. Um, how much of that's going to be seen and how much is that's going to be picked up? This part here, I need to paint these. Um, I will paint this with an airbrush and a sponge. And um, that will disguise the grow lines. 
Now, if I were to use an older style technique or a technique that a lot of people use with miniatures, which is to do dry brushing, I might as well paint the Z lines, the, the grow lines. I might, might as well paint them with neon uh, because everybody's gonna see them. But airbrushing, airbrushing that, that can make them show up a little bit, but using a sponging technique um, will make them, will disguise them very, very quickly because you're, you're basically putting on layers of translucent material and you're gonna disguise them by, by camouflaging the edges. Um, so it, you just basically modify your technique to finalize the part. But there are pieces like this guy here. I can't find the grow lines on this guy. You know, I can see the pattern of his canvas and I can see his stitches, but I can't see the grow lines on this guy. And he's just been primed um, with a tan primer. I haven't had the opportunity to paint him. A lot of my stuff just gets primed, honestly. Uh, but this is a resin copy. This is the, the, the first or second resin copy of, um, uh, of the 3D print. Um, so and I, I still have the 3D print in the box, but um, it, the answer to your question, the short answer is, is situational. And situational meaning you have to optimize what you're doing for the situation. Um, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, he also had another question. Uh, do you export as STL and ZBrush or do you, do you convert it in an external program? It's always an STL out of ZBrush. We've never ever had a reason to use a third party software. However, all of our slicing is done uh, in third party software. Some of the softwares that we use are things like Cura, Chai2 Box. Um, we even have uh, in house, we have Simplify. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the milkshake that we run, and we have many machines because I work with two different, two different shops. Uh, one shop has got about 30 machines and another shop's got about a dozen machines. Uh, some of the machines have proprietary slicers. Um, so we're going to slice and set up supports in those slicers for those machines. Um, but yeah, the SDLs all come out of ZBrush. I've never had an issue. Um, keep in mind, everything gets checked and double checked um, either by me and or uh, uh, the, the, my boss who's going to be printing the part or, or it's going to be checked by him exclusively. And he'll usually say, hey, there's something wrong here. The only issue that ever comes up is a scaling issue. Every now and again, a part usually because of a mistake in the export um, will come in at the wrong scale. Like you'll have, you know, all the parts will be in scale and then the head will be humongous. And it's like, that's weird. Let's re-export and make sure everything fits. Um, it's just a real easy fix. Uh, James McCann had a question. Um, what's your view on custom resin, resin mixing, uh, such as rigid resin mixed with a uh, flex resin? I, I'm going to say right now, most of the guys who are, most of the guys who are out there who are real professionals do some level of custom mixing. And I say this, I say this with the caveat that most of them have a clue as to what they're doing. However, it is in some cases a good idea to do small batches of experimentation. But I would make sure you read the MSDS sheets, which are the safety material data sheets, which is something that my boss and I harp on constantly, which is know what you're, know what you're mixing, know what you're working with. Because if that thing is going to outgas and poison you, um, I do not want to be responsible. And I say with great caution, have at least a couple of clues before you start mixing random things together. We do work with a, um, a, a chemist, uh, one in Texas and one in Germany, who make custom resins for us to experiment with. Um, also, some of our resins and some of our silicones and even some of our rubbers are in-house custom blended. I don't like to do it. I don't bother doing it. That's not my job. <laughs> It's kind of sketchy. Uh, my boss, both my bosses, both the people I work with, um, have a little bit of a chemistry background. Plus, they do talk to professionals who are chemists that do blend and make this stuff professionally. Be very careful if you're going to proceed with this stuff. Make sure you have somebody. Um, make sure somebody knows what you're doing. So if you suddenly collapse, they can call my own one. 
Uh, it's, it's, yeah, make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, Jane also had a question. How do you handle large overhangs in a model? Supports or cut up? Uh, if one of the big pushes in the FDM industry is to eliminate supports, uh, I go I go the extra mile to try and eliminate supports in making a model, which means that if I have overhangs, I need to cut it. Um, so I'm trying to see if I've got a part here. So if we look at this guy again, really quickly, I would not want to print this hair jutting out this way. I would much rather separate the head and cut it down the middle and then print the back of the head coming up and possibly print the face also printing up in, in, in the direction of Z. Um, I don't like supports. Uh, and I'm not saying that they aren't necessary. There are a lot of cases where you must have supports, but usually the cleanup of post-processing supports in FDM is an absolute bear. And it, it's faster to cut up your model and have a seam to deal with than it is to have to clean up all the little defects that happen on an FDM. SLA is a little different. Uh, sometimes SLA parts, which I have one, you had one until you cleaned up. I had one until it cleaned up. Yeah, the, the entire stu today was studio cleanup day. So there, there was there. I did have a part here, which is it's this giant that I created, um, and the hand is beautiful, but the hand has to print. The the arm has to print laid out so that the hand's fingers go upwards, uh, and the back of the hand, which has all this great texture on the knuckles because it's for a giant, um, is really great. But there's all these little points from the tree, uh, from the tree supports from the SLA. And that's fine, um, but I have to be careful cleaning those off or removing those with either a sand, micro sander or with clippers or whatever. Otherwise I'll damage or mar the, the texture work. Um, again, it comes back around to what's the best, what's the best situation? And SLA, SLA has a lot of power. Um, but you know, if we're talking SLA, you know, on the same note, you know, we could say we could be talking polyjet. You know, polyjet has no supports ever, but then you know the parts are usually grainier and or they're used for industrial uses, like say, for instance, housings for like a, a cylinder or like a like a uh, whatever. Um, Try to think of um, uh, a compressed air cylinder, you know, um, like a tank. Um, and that's great, and that's great for those guys, and it's great for what they're doing. Um, I have made, I have printed things with Polyjet. In fact, I started with Polyjet. It's not, it doesn't have high enough fidelity right now, and I don't think it'll ever have high enough fidelity to print um, things like characters or terrain or vehicles or weapons. Um, it's, it's better for large scale stuff. It's better for things that you don't really care about the surface having a grainy, certain grainy texture. Um, a lot of your 3D prints with color are polyjet and then they look milky and they look cloudy. Um, it's because it's a granular uh, process. It's not, um, it's not uh, the same as SLA or FDM where you're, you're putting points in or you're extruding uh, material. Different process, different results, different outcomes, different things you have to overcome. Um, real quick, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, could you give us uh, some highlights? Uh, your course is called Moving Between Dimensions, Toy Manufacturing 3D Printing Pipeline. Um, yeah. Give us a couple of uh, highlights for your course and what's your course about? Wow, highlights. Um, you're going to learn about mold jackets. Yeah. Uh, mold jackets are probably the most complicated thing I have ever had to come up with a process for. And luckily, I've worked with other professionals who have made them in fiberglass. I've made them in fiberglass, too. Uh, but we really like the idea of moving away from fiberglass because it's, it's going to be... It's going to take longer, um, but we may be able to get much better results with much more uh, refined measurements um, by 3D printing them. And, um, in vi and we're going to 3D print them in vinyl. So they're going to be FDM, which is really exciting. Um, the, the course really, guys, the, the, the course is going to cover mostly FDM and SLA style printing and making models for those things. 
and, and I'm not, I'm not going to be talking mostly about the making of the model itself, but, but how do we take a given model and get the best results out of it? Um, it's kind of, it's kind of important to really kind of look at this from, look at, look at this as you're the artist, you're making a part, you're, you're putting that part into a production pipeline. And how do you get the best possible outcome? A lot of things that, that I talk about, I take for granted because I work with other professionals who, who are very demanding about getting specific results. And so my practices and my process um, is because of them. And it's, that's why things work the way that they do. Uh, the baby dragon, for instance, that's one of the largest pieces that we've ever printed. It's, it's, I think it's over three feet long um, with the horns. And that was a custom commission for uh, a famous painter who I'm very close with uh, uh, Rick Cantu out of Texas. Um, he said, I could use the, the images for this. This is a one-off. Um, this print would not be possible if I wasn't working with other professionals. And y'all um, can see my screen, right? Right. Oh, I can see it. But I don't know. I hope, hopefully everybody else okay. can see it. Hopefully everybody can see it. <laughs> yeah. And, th and those are my boss's hands, you know. Um, but he says to me, hey, this is what we need. And this is what we, what we get. And, you know, uh, making this function is is a main part of my job his he takes this part and he puts the he applies the hollow to it because this is going to be printed on the milkshake and so that's proprietary uh slicing software and then he puts the supports on it and then we print that out and that's a uh, digital light projection or dlp uh, sla uh, pr style printer um There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Standardizing parts, uh, standardizing keys, uh, understanding how to do a CAT scan, how to fix and clean up models, how to not make keys that are gonna be full of holes, cavities, pockets, or envelopes, which all of those will get you into trouble. Um, cut up methodology, uh, that's actually a lot of fun. There's, there's basically three different types of, there's really two different types of cuts and then there's two variants to those cuts, um, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, understanding print sizes. Um, I am going to go over uh, how to do figure joints. Uh, I, we're actually going to use this guy as an example, as well as physical uh, uh, other other models in the computer which uh, have joints. Um, I've always liked this guy because uh, this is one of the more uh, articulated parts, but it has uh, both pin joints and uh, ball joints in it. Um, I love the Japanese style ball joints because you can have Say, for instance, in a wrist, you can have uh -huh. two angles of articulation or two, two articulations. Um, I'm going to talk about books uh, like um, that got me started. I'm going to talk about artists that got me started. Um, but, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to be able to cover because, you know, um, this is my, this is my, my, my jam. This is my work. This is my thing. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully everybody that's going to take the course is also going to come and say, Hey, I've got a thing that somebody else made. Like say for instance, somebody says, I want to make a piece like Simon Lee, or I want to make a bobblehead. How do I make that? And I'm going to be like, well, do you have the model? Okay. Let's talk about the cut up. Let's talk about finalization. Let's talk about what do you need to do to make the thing that you've already made into a final piece. Um, or into a production piece. A lot of times, that's that's kind of the trick right there is to to get to that point. Um, and it's it's a jump, it's a gap, and a lot of people don't realize that it's a gap that um, it's gonna it, you're gonna need somebody at the other end to uh, to sort of uh, toss you out of lead and pull you across. Um, hopefully, I'm gonna be able to help you guys do help do that for you guys and get you some of the experience that you need um, to to really make your models and your products significantly better than um, just throwing stuff at the wall, hoping something's gonna stick. Yeah, the the good thing about taking courses at XMD Academy, uh, this will be our second uh, term running courses. First term went really well. Um, one thing that uh, we kind of pride ourselves on is. Um, you having your instructor at your disposal. So, uh, <laughs> um, in, in any questions you have, you constantly, I mean, you'll have contact with Eric during uh, the whole six weeks of the course. Um, we have a forum that you can post stuff on. We have 
plenty of uh, plenty of ways to get in touch with everybody. And if you have technical issues, you can get in touch with me. Um, or if you can't get in touch with Eric, you can get in touch with me. Um, but uh, yeah, we also have a live session every week. Um, that I mean, previous uh, sessions they've yeah you know, they're minimum of an hour long, but uh, they usually run a lot. Um, yeah, and especially and with got, Eric talking. Uh, yeah, they'll, uh, I've got I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Because <laughs> most most of what we're going to be doing is we're going to talk about make it how do you get how do you get the best results out of your products. Um, and it's it's really going to come down to uh, what you guys want to do. I mean, we do have a course curriculum that I'm going to cover, but you know, you bring me a product and say, "How do I do this thing?" I'll work with you on how to figure it out. And most of it's really not that difficult. Um, it's just that it's it's not common knowledge. In fact, um, when I started getting into molding and casting, it was still considered a garage kit field. And if you didn't already know somebody that had worked in their garage for 20 years, figuring that stuff out, you were on your own trying to figure it out. You know, nobody wanted to share that knowledge with you. Um, luckily, I've had I've had the opportunity to know some extraordinary uh, molding and casting experts and. And I still work with uh, a couple of them now. Some of them are dead, <laughs> but most of most of them, most of them are still working. So, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty exciting, it's, it's pretty exciting, and it's it's going to be a really interesting course. Um, oddly enough, I think that uh, I think even Mike was saying to me, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this either. <laughs> Why is this so important? <laughs> because it's a thing and it's going to affect your work. <laughs> and the, uh, so yeah, um, Eric's course, uh, six weeks long, as we mentioned, uh, 297 for six weeks. Uh, there's also an on demand version. Um, you don't get any live interaction, but you can get all the information if you like. Uh, it's all instant uh, gratification, you get everything all at once. Um, the other thing that we'll have in the course is uh, kind of like a homework breakdown. Each week you'll have uh, something uh, to go over and kind of like a goal to set for yourself so you can um, continuously learn. You have something to push for. Uh, can you go like, you know, we have, uh, we got eight minutes left. Uh, can you go over the homework just a little bit like what you're, uh, basically what I'm trying to do guys is I'm trying to, with the homework is, is I'm trying to help you guys. Um, I want you guys to make mistakes so that I can point it out to you when it doesn't matter in a classroom setting. Um, and then you'll never make that mistake again. For instance, like the clearance on keys or, you know, um, uh, missing something in a, um, in a CAT scan or not having, or having floaters in your model, um, all of those things, which are gonna cause, um, cause you to have issues once you go to print. Um, that's really what the homework is there for. It's there to, to help, help you guys, you know, troubleshoot uh, what it is to make a model ready for 3D printing. Um, it's not about ego because I don't give a shit. I really don't. And it's not about, you know, getting it right because it's all about optimization. You're looking for the ideal. There is no right or wrong as long as it works. Okay. Um, and that's, that's why when somebody asks me, you know, what brush do you use? Or do you do this thing that's special that I care about? And it's, I'm just looking at it and I'm like, I don't understand why you care about that. You know, it's not meant to be hurtful. It's just, I want you guys to get the optimal results for you in your product. And I'm going to be straight with you about it. And I'm going to call you on your bullshit. And I would expect the same from any other professional. And that's just, that's how, just how it is. It's just how it is. I don't have time to hold your hand and tell you, you know, Hey, you're doing a great job. Um, if you're not, I'm going to tell you what, how it is. Because when I work with other professionals, same deal. They don't have time to give me uh, ass pets and be like, you're doing good. And you produce a pile of crap. <laughs> You guys want to be professionals. You guys want to learn how to do this stuff. You guys want to have a better understanding of how to make a professional product like this guy. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. Then I'm going to help you guys figure out how to do that. And, and you know, got a contour key here, got a contour key here. 
you know, and, and I drill, drilled a hole in them and pegged them to this base. So, and it's got a great big undercut. You can see the undercut right through here, you know? So this was the, this is the second, this is the third or fourth 3D print that I ever did, but this was the first professional grade 3D print I did. It was for a client. It's a little dusty. I'm still cleaning up the dust in the house, but it gives you an idea about what's possible. And I'd like to help you guys get there if you want to take the course. If you don't want to take the course, I'm glad you came to the webinar at the very least. <laughs> so. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much to everybody that uh, came for this. Um, we, we love sharing all this information with you. Um, Eric is an amazing instructor. So uh, you should definitely take this course if you want to master some 3D printing. I've learned a lot from him just by watching his course while I was setting it all up. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's great. Um, and I, go I, I'm, I'm, I was going to say, guys, I'm really to the point about stuff, um, but I will also talk your ear off. You know, you want to know something. You want to ask me questions. You want to know about the models that I'm making. You want to know about the product that I'm making. You want to know. Pretty much anything as long as we're as long as we got the time to do it and we're not wasting anybody else's time because you know we got to be considerate of all the other people that might be taking the course i will talk to you all day long if if it's uh if it's if it's going to help you make a better product Does anybody got any last second questions we got like four, quick quick four minutes by the way, this is this is my studio. It is a it is it is finally not a mess, <laughs> but there there are pieces of art from all over the world and from all different types of people, and some of it I can't reach. Some of it I've inherited, and some of it I've made myself, and some of it I've had the pleasure of meeting the original artist and and being capable of uh, getting to know them. Um, I love, I love making stuff. I love making stuff. Sadly, this is not a 3D print. This is something that I inherited from my grandfather when he passed away. But. Uh, okay, uh, real quick, Eric said, should we start with an FDM printer as a novice? I don't think that it matters. If you want to do FDM printing, you do FDM printing. If you want to do SLA printing, you do SLA printing. Um, those are the types of printers that most people are looking at. Um, the printer I have, my personal printer is a CR10S, which is an FDM style printer. And it's because of one of the main types of work that I'm doing is making terrain for tabletop gaming. Your, your output is what matters the most and your situation is what matters the most. Um, an SLA printer needs a lot of ventilation. It also needs a lot of temperature control and humidity control. They can be just as temperamental as an FDM printer, um, but an SLA printer, I've heard horror stories about people that run them in a closet in their bedroom or have them in their kitchen. Oh. And, and, and I'm like, you're contaminating your family with outgassing and you're possibly contaminating your family with um, droplets or particulate. Um, it, 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 it's not both machines have different requirements, okay? It's, it's like the difference between purchasing a sports car and purchasing a truck. You're not gonna use the sports car to haul manure, okay? And you're not gonna use the truck normally in a drag race or, or, or on an uphill climb, um, like a timed uphill climb. You're picking, the, you're picking the tool that best fits your desired outcome. If, if you, you'll hear me tell stories about my family who's all engineers, it's all about optimization for your outcome. You know, you're trading one thing for another. You're getting this benefit, but you're losing out on this. You're, like an SLA printer, generally they print longer time periods, but you're getting a higher quality print because you have a smaller Z layer. So it's like I said, that question isn't easily answered in the way that you're asking it. It's not, I'm not trying to belittle you or anything. I'm trying to say, the question needs to be changed to, to suit the, 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 the subject. All right, and uh, Eric's course uh, starts on July 15th, which is next Monday. So if y'all want to get in, it is filling up very quickly. Um, so hurry up and sign up. I would sign up 
uh, very quickly this week. Um, just so you guarantee yourself a spot. Um, yeah, so it's moving between dimensions, toy manufacturing, the 3D printing pipeline with Eric Askew. And thank you all for coming. And we will uh, hopefully see you during the course. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it.